Okay, so thank you, Dougie, for the introduction, and again, welcome everyone to Mindshare 50. Uh, as Doug mentioned, I've been involved for many years now, and so it's been sort of a beautiful and long and often strange road. And I'm here today to tell you about how foolish you are, and probably try to convince you a little bit that we're all mentally ill. Uh, and honestly, I'd love to tell you that we're mentally in a really great way, and of course, we do have lots of pathologies that are kind of not pathologies, but in this case, I'm going to tell you about some of the things that we do that I wish we could correct. And that's why I think it fits the theme of what comes next. So first off, let me tell you what I am. I'm not a psychologist, but I am a scientist and a skeptical one at that. And this talk is about overcoming biases and trying to be better at making rational decisions in hopes that we'll sprout new awareness of our mind and ourselves and our surroundings. So there's a, the American Psychological Association puts out this book called the DSM, the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual, and it's basically the Bible of mental illness. Like anything that can possibly go wrong inside your mind, they have documented. This disease, anosognosia, which comes from Greek meaning not knowledge disease, that's the three parts of that word, means a condition in which a person who suffers disability seems unaware of the existence of his or her disability. Usually refers to something like stroke, where someone will get disabled physically and are literally unaware of it, even though they say they want to do things that they can't physically do anymore. This guy on the right, Cicero, 2100 years ago, noted it is peculiar, it is the peculiar quality of a fool to perceive the faults of others and to forget his own. And so basically he sort of really figured out that there's a different type of anosognosia that happens in our minds. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. The conflict that occurs in our minds that creates uh, the inability to see our own faults originates inside this blue part of the brain right up here called the anterior cingulate cortex. And it's in charge of dealing with, with conflict inside of your brain. And I wanted to give you a visceral experience of what kind of conflict we're talking about. And so, first off, that type of the formal definition for uh, this, this conflict of information inside your brain is called incongruence. And what we mean by that is something like a disagreement between a desire and the required capabilities to achieve that desire, or disagreeing between external information sources and some internal model of reality. We'll be focusing mostly on that second one. So I'm gonna ask for a little bit of audience participation. It's not difficult, I promise. Okay, so first, I'd like you to speak aloud the correct colors of the following circles clockwise as fast as you can. When you're finished, be quiet, okay? Go. Okay, it took you about three seconds. That was pretty easy, right? Now let's, same exact directions, okay? Let's do it again. Ready, go. It took you about six seconds. It took about twice as long. So you probably felt this part of your brain that was like f faltering at the idea of saying the right thing. Even though I gave you precisely the same instructions, I gave you precisely the same kind of data, but except I, I gave you a conflicting piece of information, the part of your brain that sorted out that, conf that conflict was the anterior cingulate cortex. This test is called the Stroop test. Let's do something a little more interesting, though. Something maybe a little more relevant. In total silence and with all the honesty that you can muster, I want you to look at the image I'm about to present to you, and then I want you, by responding to my cues, I'll give you some instructions to the upcoming statement. I'm gonna split you into two groups, okay? If you were born on an even day, you are group one. If you were born on an odd day, you are group two, okay? Group two, please close your eyes. Okay, let's see, all right. Group one, keep your eyes open. All right, so this is your image, group one. This is the statement. How many of you would agree with that statement? Okay, how many of you would disagree with that statement? You can be honest, it's okay, come on. All right, uh, group one, please close your eyes. Group two, please open your eyes. All right, this is your image. This is the statement. How many of you agree with that statement? Okay, how many of you disagree with that statement? Okay, the statistics were a little bit poor. Everyone can open your eyes now. This is the statement I gave to both of you. Uh, didn't work out quite as well as I wanted, but there were more people that responded negatively to this statement in the second case where I presented a grotesque image. And it's well known in psychological studies that I can present to you a totally irrelevant piece of information that affects your ability to make a rational decision, to come to a conclusion that is consistent with evidence, even though the information has nothing to do with it. And I was trying to, to do that here. 
And the, the fact of the matter is that whether you thought something that was natural or was not natural, there are all these different cases where it doesn't matter what you think. There's actually a fact of it. And the, for instance, in the case of homosexuality, which is not the point of this talk, there are over 500 species where it's well documented. It's found in 1500. It's found on land, sea, and air. It's in mammals, birds, lizards, fish, and insects. It happens everywhere. I also want you to note that this lion is licking affectionately the other lion's eye. I think this. Um, <laughs> And I don't, I don't really understand this one, but I, I felt like it fit into that category. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so the point is, is that you, not only can you be compromised, but there are times when they're just simple facts and you may not agree with them even though they're facts. And so what's going on to some degree is that inside this thing inside your head, the brain, there's a lot of connections. It's called the diffusion, ten diffusion tensor image. And this is not even remotely close to all of the connections, but it gives you an idea for how interconnected the brain is. So when I trigger one part of your brain, for instance, the part associated with the emotion of disgust, it crosstalks with other parts of your brain that tend to compromise your ability to make rational decisions. Let me give you a very relevant example. This is Newt Gingrich. I'm not supporting Newt Gingrich, but what I want you to see here is, first off, they use the word facts. They make a statement which has absolutely no facts in it. And they use words like sleaze, and they'll actually darken the pupils of the subject to try to get you to distrust them. They will feed you information in a way and try to make you feel some way subconsciously so that you end up getting this crosstalk that compromises your ability to make rational decisions. And with that, let's move on to kind of the two main parts of the talk, logic and beliefs and your self-image. So first off, the main question here is for me, and I hope for you as well, is why in the face of overwhelming evidence do people cling to incorrect beliefs? If you go back to that manual that I mentioned earlier, the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual, you look up delusion, it says a belief held with strong conviction despite superior evidence to the contrary. I hate to tell you, but I think that means that a large percentage of the US population is mentally ill, uh, in the sense that they're operating under delusional pretenses. And let me give you some examples. We just talked about the nature of homosexuality. Does, did Iraq have weapons of mass destruction? After the Iraq Commission came out with its report saying that there was absolutely no evidence to suggest that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and after Bush himself corroborated that report, the number of people that believed that they had them went up. Men are better drivers than women. Men are better than, with money than women. Both are untrue. Men are 77% more likely to die in a car accident than a woman. And they are uh, far worse at investing. Obama is a Muslim. This is my favorite one, maybe. Since the day he took office, the number of people that believe that he is a Muslim now is 63% higher, according to Pew Research, than it was when he first took office. There's no sound evidence for the, to support the theory of evolution. I'm honestly not even gonna honor that one with a response because the evidence is so overwhelming. The scientific consensus on global warming is poor. You hear that all the time repeated in the media, especially media of certain leaning. And the truth is that 97% of climatologists worldwide agree that global warming is happening and that it's caused by human uh, effects. And all of the major national academies of scientists worldwide also agree. So that's simply patently false. So what is going on here? Well. Part of what happens is that there's this visceral side of your brain, this emotional side that responds to cues more quickly than your rational side can respond. So if you are presented with a piece of information that is incongruent with your beliefs, it triggers a similar part of your brain that's related to like fight or flight response. It's a threatening piece of information. And so here's the kind of uh, schematic of what's happening to people who are unable to incorporate this information and amend their, their internal mental structures. They're presented with information that's inconsistent with a belief. That immediately elicits a visceral and an emotional response that tends to mute the rational centers of the brain. After the fact, when the rational center kind of catches up a little bit, you have things like motivated reasoning, confirmation bias, which means you look for information that supports your side and, and don't look for information that does not support your side. You do things like source discrediting, where you try to, even though in a regular instance you would not discredit the source, if it disagrees with you, you try to say, oh, well, they're, I don't trust them, and you know, they're, who are they, and that kind of thing. And it, then you resolve, that, that process resolves this internal cognitive dissonance, meaning the disagreement between these streams of information. And that resolution feels good. It's like a cookie. You know, it's like, ah, I, I solved this problem, even though you didn't really solve the problem. But the point is, you, you got to that point where it felt that way. And that resolution reaffirms the erroneous belief. And so the result is that when, in studies they've shown this, when you present information to someone who does not want to be convinced, even if the information is crystal clear and true, they are more likely to believe the erroneous belief after you've presented the argument, which is sort of a depressing statement. And if you want to understand this a little bit differently, I tried to make kind of a pictorial representation. For someone who has a generally well-constructed mental framework, if there's something in there that's illogical and doesn't fit properly, the prospect of removing it and putting in a new block that does is not particularly threatening. It just makes the whole structure a little bit better. For someone who's 
kind of disorganized, who doesn't have all their mental frameworks in order, who has maybe multiple pieces of illogical uh, thinking in their, in their mind, the prospect of removing a piece threatens the structural integrity of the whole. It's a far more threatening proposition for that person. And then just imagine what happens when you pile lots of people on top, you get groupthink and all sorts of peer support, and it becomes very difficult to convince people in groups. So I did want to arm you with a little bit of information on maybe how you could get around this sort of thing. So first off, it almost always needs to be done one-on-one. -on -one. It is extremely difficult to convince people in groups because no matter what the group thinks, whether it's right or wrong, they will tend to support each other. If at all possible, point out what mutual goal you're trying to reach. That means you can't, it's very difficult to convince somebody to climb a different mountain than you want to climb, so you should try to at least decide on which mountain you're trying to get to the top of. If applicable, point out which things they understand correctly. This convinces them that you respect their intelligence and it gives you some common ground to start from. Strongly encourage people to check the source. And I say that because in this day and age, we live in the blogosphere, people take information, they rehash it, they rehash it again, they rehash it again. There's a game of telephone that goes on, so finally you're not really sure what was actually said at the beginning. And then try your best at all points to not offend them, because if you do, you will elicit that emotional response and you've more or less sealed the deal that you're not gonna be able to convince them of anything. So basically, it's like you're removing this Jenga piece from underneath the structure, trying to carefully put it a new piece in it. It has to be delicately done. You have to build scaffolding, mental scaffolding, to keep the rest of their structure intact while you do this sort of little delicate operation. And I'll give you an example of, you know, you, you might think, you're, oh, I'm really smart and I, I don't fall subject to these sorts of things. Well, this is Richard Dawkins. Uh, I happen to agree with almost all of his viewpoints, but I think his methodology is flawed, and I'll tell you why. That evidence I just told you about, the fact that when you present an argument to somebody, they tend not to believe it if you elicit an emotional response, but he does that all the time, and even though he knows that, so he's also subject to the fact that he can't follow through with a clearly logical framework. People who are a little bit better at it are people like Carl Sagan and Sam Harris, if you want to like, understand uh, maybe how to better do this. And it turns out it's, it's beyond just balancing a right argument versus a wrong argument. It even comes down to simple numbers and probability within people's minds. For instance, if you ask people, you, know, you say to people, I want to earn money, that's my, my goal, I'm going to take a risk and earn some cash. That's the, that's the definition of investing. And you say 50% of the time when I flip this coin, you know, it lands tails, you're going to lose $100, and 50% of the time when it gets heads, you're going to win $200. On average, every flip's going to earn you $50. The number of people who take this bet is extremely low. Yet, people go to the casino and gamble against themselves when they know the probability works against them. So people are even irrational when it comes to very simple, provable things. And so, to end this section, the key is, if you are one of these people, if you have maybe, hopefully, in the last five minutes, come to the conclusion, oh shit, I'm, I'm one of these people, uh, admit to your, yourself that your rational decisions can be subconsciously compromised. Be open to reasonable persuasions. Don't join a cult. Uh, embrace the notion that facts are impersonal. When someone's presenting you with an argument, they're not, hopefully, they're not trying to offend you, they're just trying to correct you, and that is not something that is necessarily an attack on you. And so finally, I wanna talk a little bit about self-image, and it's, of course, related to this. So, it turns out that if you go around, you ask people to rate themselves with, within whatever group they find themselves, usually their peer group, they will tell you, oh, I have better than average memory. Most people will say that. They went onto Facebook and they did social network analysis and they asked people, how, how popular do you think you are in your friend group? Most people said they're more popular than average. Driving skills, 93% of American drivers say, I'm better than the average driver. Uh, relationship happiness, job and academic performance. At, at Stanford, 87% of Stanford MBAs say they're in the top 50% of their class when you ask them. And 70% of university professors say that they're in the top 50% with teaching ability. So people have this, this ability to convince themselves of things that are not true all over the place. We're going to talk about six and seven more in a second. And this is maybe my favorite one. If you go to any group of people and you ask them, and you even, let's say that you watch this talk, we even do this later if you want, and I say, how susceptible do you think you are to bias? Do you think you're more or less susceptible than average? Most people will say they're less susceptible than average, which of course is itself a bias. So on the job, let's talk about this. Uh, people exhibit this illusory superiority, being better than they think they are all the time. So Daniel Kahneman is uh, the Nobel Prize winner in economics from two years ago, and he went to a firm many years ago, and he got trading information for 25 different traders over an eight-year period. And his presumption was, oh, if these people are skilled, if this job requires skill, then what you'd expect is that over time, you know, one person would have one level of performance, you know, maybe on average 4% income on these investments, one, people, one person had a little bit higher. If they had no skill, you'd expect it to be randomly correlated over time. That would indicate that they have no ability to actually make judgments that earn the money overall. 
And when he asked the people, do you think your job requires skill, every one of them responded, yes. And you know what? All of the data showed there was no correlation. They basically were as good as rolling dice. As an example, here's an even better example because it has, has to do with something aesthetic. You're like, well, that's numbers. Like, I can, I can categorize money and I can think about it in a very quantitative way. Well, how about this? They took wine and they split people, uh, they, they asked people to be split into two groups. They had a low knowledge group, people who said, oh, I don't really know wine that well. And then they had a high knowledge group of people that said, oh yeah, I know wine really well. And then they split them up and they, gave, they bought different kinds of wine, you know, high quality and low quality wine. And they randomized the order as they gave them to each person and said, could you please pick your favorite wine or the best wine? And presumably, if there was any skill in picking wine, then no matter what the order of the wine, you'd be able to pick it out. Now, when they gave it to the low knowledge group, people strongly tend to pick the first wine, regardless of what order it's presented in. So that right away tells you they, don't, they also don't really have the ability to tell, and it means that you're just likely to pick whatever one you're, you're first presented with. The interesting part is that for the high knowledge group, that effect got accentuated. They were more biased to pick just the first wine or the last wine. These effects are called primacy and recency. And so, there, there they are saying, I know wine, but actually they were significantly more subject to the bias of positioning than the people who didn't know anything about wine. Okay, so presumably when you do a job that, require, that is an important job that requires skill, hopefully your competence increases in commensuration with the skill required. Unfortunately, that seems not to be the case all the time. So why are so many people incompetent in positions that require, and I'm supposed to say competence underneath there, uh, <laughs> Ironically, it's not my fault. <laughs> so, I mean, it's such a pandemic that there's both an English and an American version of the show called The Office, you know, putting this on display for everyone to see. And this, there's an effect called the Dunning-Kruger effect, and this is the last thing we're going to cover. So this is a histogram of intelligence, you know, in the, in the world population. So the mean intelligence is 100, and then smarter people to the right, and less intelligent people are to the left. And presumably, if you have a task that requires skill, you'd want people to be at above average intelligence to do that task, to be, you know, be president or whatever. Um, <coughs> it turns out that when you, when you test in, oh, above average intelligence people, like they will test at above average intelligence, there's an effect that takes place. They tend to underestimate their own intelligence and they tend to overestimate the intelligence of others, okay? Now, for the less or below average intelligence people, it's not quite the same. They tend to overestimate their own intelligence, not super surprising, and the thing that happens in the other case is they are unable to judge the skill, competence, or intelligence of others. They're, there's just no correlation any longer. It's not like they underrate them, they just can't tell. So now, imagine what this means. For any hierarchical organization, a government, a company, it means that you're basically, if I hire an intelligent person, they're likely to hire someone who's less intelligent than them, and the less intelligent person is likely to hire somebody at random, right? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm dead serious. And so you've always wondered, what is wrong with hierarchical, why, is it, why does this happen? Like, what is going on? And it's basically, you're doing this sieving, right? You're doing a sieve of fools. You're taking smarter people and actually promoting, not promoting them into the higher ranks because, and it's, and it's not the fault of the less intelligent people, it's the fault of both groups of people. And so people have determined many times that the way to get around this is to flatten hierarchies, to make them shorter, and then you get less of this filtering effect. And so, I just want to close by giving you some ideas on how maybe to get around this illusory superiority and the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, first, define what you're optimizing so that you know if you're improving. You can't possibly get anywhere unless you know where you're headed. Employ quantitative metrics if, whenever possible so that you can do some sort of unbiased evaluation. Your memory is completely subject to all of these biases, so you can't just remember it or be like, oh, I think I was doing better some time ago, you know? Beg people for honest and impersonal feedback, and I say beg because in general, after this talk, I might ask some of you how I did, and you, you're liable just to be nice, even if you think it sucked. So, take pride in the future improvement, not in your current state. And this goes back to that thing about visceral versus cognitive. If you take pride in your current state, you're gonna be defensive when someone tries to give you information to improve it, but if you take pride in your future state, then you see that as an opportunity to be a better person in the future. So with that, let me end by quoting Bertrand Russell, the whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves, but wiser people so full of doubts. And so with that, I hope you will uh, examine yourselves more closely, myself included. Thank you very much.